Good morning. Uh, welcome to the third day of our conference, Invisible Designs of Social Experience. We hope that, uh, that you enjoyed the conference so far. So now I would like to uh, uh, present uh, our fourth uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Joseph Oduro Frimpong. Mm. He is a media anthropologist at the Asheshi University uh, in Ghana, in West Africa. Uh, he directs the newly created Center for African Popular uh, Culture at the Asheshi University. Um, in his research, uh, he spotlights and examines uh, the role of popular media in unraveling uh, the complexities of social and political life. Uh, his current project explores first local understandings of pleasure in uh, uh, satirical works and second, a visual mediation of suspicion in popular media. He has curated exhibitions on Ghanaian political cartoons at the Rhodes University in South Africa, hand-painted book uh, covers of significant works in African cultural studies at the University of Birmingham, uh, collaboration posters and hand-painted movie posters at Alliance Francaise in Ghana, uh, and uh, about his recent publications. So these are, um, uh, for instance, forward, upward, onward narratives and achievements in African and European uh, contexts published in 2020. Taking African cartoons seriously, politics, satire, and um, uh, culture published in 2018, and uh, African popular culture, the episteme uh, of everyday life, published in uh, 2014. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Oduro Frimpong, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Monica, for this um, nice introduction. And um, how's it called? Also the invitation to come and present um, at this conference. So let me begin. Um, <laughs> with a very shocking observation um, I made when I began my career in 2012. And this observation relates to my realization that not even one uh, Ghanaian university offered a course in African or Ghanaian popular culture. My inquiries in other African countries as to whether such a course is taught there through my colleagues also revealed the same situation. This experience led me to further investigate if I could locate a possible academic center or academic center solely devoted to the study of popular culture on the African continent or even in other parts of the world. And here too, I became aware that unlike the numerous African studies centers all over the globe, no center on African popular culture exists or existed until my center was opened on the planet. These findings strengthened my resolve to ensure the visibility of African popular culture in academic circles in two key ways. First, to begin to seriously publish works which draws from Ghanaian popular media cultural life, and in doing so, to concretely make it clear to my institution and others, especially on the continent, about the intellectual significance of popular cultural practices to current academic debates. In this direction, my work on Ghanaian hip life a music genre that blends American hip hop music with that of Ghanaian music aesthetics demonstrated the utility of Robertson's 1992 localization concept as a heuristic lens to explore hybrid practices from a nuanced perspective. As well, my work on popular video movies demonstrated how some of the videos, especially those around cyber fraud, believed to be associated with occult practices provided insights into recent approaches to religion from a material perspective. My latter resolve to make visible popular culture discussions within academic debates, at least in Ghana and on the continent, led me to conceive and convince my institution to establish and let me direct the Center for African Popular Culture in Ghana. The academic mission of the center in tandem with my university's vision is to provide outstanding quality teaching, scholarship and service to uh, institutions on the continent by leading and excelling in African popular culture scholarship. In realizing this mission, the center aims to bring together um, academics and non-academics to help forge the development of knowledge and theorizing from the local um, to the continent to the global arena. 
Furthermore, the center aims to develop public awareness of the intellectual dimensions of African popular culture through engagement with writers, filmmakers, musicians, etc. It is the same passion um, that it is this same passion to make visible and encourage the engagement of popular media genres in our research, which informs my presentation today. Towards this goal, I draw on an aspect of my current research on Ghanaian satire to demonstrate how this genre of visual satire um, has, for example, a gradual acceptance in geopolitical and international relations research that should be equally be brought under our wider scholarly investigation as a veritable source in our conversations. Second, to propose that as a matter of agency, we should accept and begin to seriously explore local and grounded epistemologies that are usually sidelined as a way of expanding our ways of knowing and experiencing the world. In pursuing this focus, this presentation responds to renewed and recent scholarly calls in academia for a critical re-examination of various facets of global academic disciplinary practices within the ivory tower. A key area in need of such crucial reform relates to dogmatic and exclusionary code, positivist fantasy of equal but separate research um, arenas, which eschew inter or poly and transdisciplinary approaches to knowledge production. This situation gives credence to the charge that Although, and here I'm quoting Yamjo, although intended as convivial spaces by excellence, uh, universities are not convivial in practice as one would expect. In this presentation, I am inspired by Francis Nyamjo's 2017 proposal of, quote, the currency of conviviality, unquote, as an antidote to this academic malaise to aid in reconfiguring um, such prescriptive disciplinary practices. Conviviality, as Nyamjo makes us aware, is best understood not from the perspective of moribund logics of dualisms, but rather within an acknowledged incompleteness as a normal order of things and of being, or, and of being which quote, privileges interconnections and interdependencies, end of quote. An aspect of Nyamjo's convivial scholarship relevant to my talk today embraces not just conversations and quote, conversations and collaborations acro across disciplines in the conventional sense, but also, and even more importantly, the integration of sidestepped popular epistemologies informed by popular universes and ideas of reality, end of quote. Here, my work contributes to Nyamjo's vision of convivial scholarship, which we appreciate dynamic um, popular uh, expressions and meaning making as a means to engage the world. In the sections below, um, I explore visual satirical works which deal with Ghana-China relations that are ignored within, that are ignored or gradually accepted within former geopolitical discourses. The goal is to show and thus encourage geopolitical scholars and even all of us that they should begin to explore the domain of everyday life through popular visual satirical media where key geopolitical issues are examined. Second, through an investigation of locally inflated Ghanaian understanding of pleasure, I show how this move affords us a more expansive understanding of the concept which moves as beyond the limited vision inherent in the English equivalent. I explore the above concerns through the visual satirical works of Bright Aquare, a well-respected Ghanaian visual satirist. Okay. Yeah, so in 2017, uh, ambassador, Chinese ambassador to Ghana, uh, San Ba Hong, um, attended an exhibition titled Confils in Accra, curated by um, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. During her exhibition tour, she visited an allotted space of Accra and had a picture, which you see here, taken standing next to the latest satirical piece by this artist. What is intriguing about Madame Ba Hong's uh, photo taking opportunity is that the work visually satirized her posturing in an open letter to the government of Ghana. In that letter, she complained about, quote, a number of distorted or biased reports and stories on Chinese people, especially reports and cartoons that are defaming Chinese leaders and senior officials. The note came soon after a quest uh, work titled With a Beg, a piece critical of the Chinese government that went viral in Ghana and beyond. 
The missive, the missive ended with what can be considered a veiled warning in view of China's global superpower status compared to Ghana. And this is what, uh, this is part of what the letter said. The Chinese is very concerned about this unhealthy tendency. We hope that the Ghanaian government will pay due attention to this situation, take the necessary step to stop such actions from happening again, and guide the media uh, to give an objective coverage you know, on the issue, so as to create a good environment for further development um, of bilateral exchanges and cooperation." End of quote. The above story shows how a key Ghana-China geopolitical issue was debated in everyday life through a popular visual satirical media. Yet, the current research on Africa-China media communicative practices on popular media and literary genres is scarce and mostly does not pay attention to the specifics of China's engagement with various African countries. And there are uh, key exceptions to what I've said. And here I can quote Jeloski and uh, Thomas 2017 and Monsami 2019. In view of the above limitation, Jeloski and Rotensala proposed broadening the scope of this research field to include non-traditional media formats, or in their words, to investigate the specificity of the media texts that are produced and circulated on the ground. The significance of such contributions can strengthen the field in two major ways. First, it can help counter the pervasive and erroneous view that African audiences are completely reliant on foreign media, neglecting the fact that Africans produce and consume their own domestic media the most. Secondly, it can concretely establish the diversity within African media ecology in the context of Africa-China media communications field. On the other hand, as Wakesa persuasively demonstrates in his comprehensive review of the literature, there, there is a rich body of research that have explored, excuse me, yeah, that have explored the macro implications of growing Africa-China um, media um, connections from a range of perspectives embedded in uh, political economy and what Aden calls the interna international relationesque approach. A key limitation of these works um, is the lack of innovative ground up theoretical approaches. Since as uh, Wakesa notes, quote, theoretical lacuna are everywhere in the Africa channel media and communicative field. And this presents an opportunity for establishing for establishing emerging researchers to make an, an original contribution. Here, Wekesa is calling for a development of innovative theoretical approaches in the field in terms of the fact that uh, like any working sensing device, they will allow us to detect and capture certain ground realities associated with the larger field of Africa, China media and communication. In doing so, um, this presentation contributes to the scholarship on Africa, China media and communication research in two significant ways. First, I focus on Ghana popular media genre of visual satire, and in doing so, contribute to the sparse research in this uh, this sparse research on popular media in African spaces. Here, I explore three works of Bright Aque. The rationale to investigate Aque's work lies in how his pieces have received wide, wide critical attention in both official, unofficial domains such as social media sites, as well as in official circles through invitations to lecture at institutions such as Rhodes University in South Africa. The second contribution of this work in view of Wakesa's call, um, the second contribution of this work in view of Wakesa's observation of how current Africa, China media and communication scholarship is quote, devoid of any theoretical anchor is to offer my theoretical perspective that I term as critical entertainment. I developed this term based upon my field research insights into Ghanaian popular media genres such as political cartoons, political hip life, um, and photoshopped images. So in the sections below, um, I detail my analytical approach which guides my investigation um, into Aquarius works. So, um, I propose that a critical entertainment approach is a fruitful way 
to investigate uh, popular geopolitical discourses around Africa-China relations found across uh, different popular media genres. What animates this framework is Chabal's de-Westernizing perspective to African politics. Here, he encourages scholars to uh, he encourages scholars who seek to have a firmer grasp on how contemporary African politics actually works uh, to reject the austere formalism um, that characterizes traditional understanding of, quote, power in terms of the state and resistance in terms of civil society, the one being the converse of the other. In rejecting the above approach, Chabal suggests that a much more productive alternative lens to help comprehend contemporary politics in Africa is to recognize, quote, the nature of power and exploration of the ways and byways um, of resistance to power through tackling, tra uh, tackling questions from the position of informality and agency. So uh, in operationalizing such a refashioned understanding of resistance not associated with the idea of civil society uh, requires what Williams and Obadari terms as tracking its parallel infrastructures. And here I deem, you know, um, the, uh, the visual satire works of Aquare as an example of such parallel infrastructures. So what makes the critical entertainment concept a very a compelling heuristic framework to use in exploring uh, popular media uh, communication on Africa-China relations? Here, I argue that the approach allows us to appreciate that beyond the humor Acquire satirical visual discourse, articulate unique and, criti uh, and critically divergent viewpoints on a wide range of important geopolitical matters in, a, in ways that are locally meaningful to audiences. In addition, in using the insights of Williams and Obadari's notion of resistance, I situate Acquire's works within the broader democratic practices of ordinary citizens' participation in critical discussions in Ghana. <clears throat> Last, lastly, through the analytical lens of critical entertainment, I argue that Aquarius work, unlike literature and art cinema, uh, which are far often less localized and far less rooted in the social life of any one community, offer a legitimately unique kind of criticism. Specifically, his critiques provide rapid, widely disseminated, and locally legible responses to unfolding events. All right, so to investigate <clears throat> acquire satirical works um, within quote, the political friendship and animosities, and here I'm quoting Monsami as critical entertainment, I explore the comedic dimensions of three of his pieces, as well as examine two of his visualized thematic interests. These concerns are on Chinese involvement in illegal mining in Ghana and African leaders misplaced priorities which he believes have shifted their critical engagement with China. In terms of the issues of some of Chinese, um, Chinese citizens' illegal mining activities in Ghana, which Akwal tackles in his piece with a bag, one has to contextualize um, the work by linking it to its release. <clears throat> and here, let me go back a little bit. I'm talking about this particular image. Aquarius showcases the work through social media sites <clears throat> at the height of Ghana's uh, government campaign to minimize or eliminate illegal small scale mining due to the practices, serious environmental concerns. During the campaign, amongst those arrested by the Ghana police and the military were some Chinese residents. In a meeting to Ghana support for the campaign, Mr. Peter Amewu, Ghana's uh, Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, begged Madame Boahong for her to deal with the issue. It is this government official's perceived docility in a context where some Chinese citizens had defied Ghanaian law, which acquire partially critiques in this way. The other concern tackles a, a level of lopsidedness in Ghana, Ghana's friendship with China, especially when it comes to gold extraction. We witnessed this humorously rendered rendered imbalance in an image that showed China symbolized um, by the seated giant-like figure in the, pres in the likeness of the current Chinese president, pouring ostensibly dirty drinking water, referencing bodies of polluted water by gold mining activities. 
into the calabashes held by Ghana, symbolized by, two, symbolized by the two kneeling diminutive men. And the men that you see here uh, on your right, the short gentleman uh, holding the calabash to the right is Ghana's president. And the one to your left is the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. As already noticed, noted, it is in response to this biting critique that the Chinese mission in Accra released a statement which hinted that Ghana's government should censor quote, popular media reportage on the Chinese um, involvement in um, illegal gold mining activities. And it is in an apparent response to this statement to which the Ghana government did not react that Bright uh, Aquair released what can be considered a sequel to the first piece uh, with a bag titled Them Threatened, which we see here. In this work, Aquair visualizes the threat of the Chinese mission open letter via uh, Bolo Young, a muscular villain in Hong Kong and Hollywood movies, which were popular in Ghana in the uh, early 80s, way into the late 90s. The Ghanaian government's silence in response to the letter signals a possible acquiescence to the threat made by the Chinese mission. Aquarius entertainingly highlights this perspective through the befuddled look um, of, of a gentleman in the likeness of Ghana's president, weakly attempting to hide his protest signage and the mocking response epitomized in the displayed grin from the woman in the likeness of Madame Bahon, seeming, seemingly to indicate an I dare you swagger. In the piece titled Occupation, Bright comments on African leaders' unwillingness to interrogate the implications of their ongoing uh, political friendship with China. Although humorously, acquire humorously and bears this visual critique in what is known in popular West African discourse as the Jollof debate wars. Jollof is a classic one pot dish consisting of rice cooked in infinite infinite um, infinite ingredient variations. The famous disputes, quote unquote, is about which West African version of jollof is best. In the image, the three gentlemen wearing chef's garb and in the likeness of three African presidents, Senegal, Ghana, and Nigeria, seem to be having a discussion about the jollof in front of them. While the trial are happy are happily and deeply engrossed in this deliberation, a gentleman in the semblance of the current Chinese person grins while walking away with a black shaped object in the likeness of the African map. In the piece, Aquarius critique, critique seems to be that African leaders are dangerously disinterested in questioning China's quest to forge political friendship um, with African countries. Conversely, um, China's professed interest in mutual relations with Africa is not to the continent's benefit, and it is in fact duplicitous at best. From the, from the discussion, what is clear is that researchers um, interested in geopolitical matters, you know, uh, need to invest more efforts into popular cultural formats, engagement, in, and in this case, uh, with Africa-China media um, and communication. The rationale for this position as evidence in the above discussion reveals um, how geopolitical discussion, quote, is an everyday occurrence that also happens outside of academia in the policy world. So to bring a close to this particular discussion, um, the discussion responds to the calls in Africa, China media and communication scholarship to do two things. First, to complement prior scholarship by investigating media as localized discourses which examine the specificities of Africa-China relations on the ground. And second, to anchor popular visual culture research in a theoretically rigorous framework. In doing so, my investigation has been guided by the question, what are some of the problematic specificities of Africa-China relations which popular media artists in their role as public intellectuals examine? And as has been clear, I pursue this question within the three pieces of uh, Bright's work. In analyzing these works, it became clear, or it has become clear, that uh, Aquarius humorous pieces articulate grave concerns. In all, 
Aquarius work captures certain contradictions in the ethics of engagement in Africa-China geopolitical discussions, such as the stereotypical image of poor Africa as a beggar for Chinese ligers, as we see in We the Beg. However, just as we witnessed in occupation, where um, a figure in the image of uh, President Jinping carries away an object and the shape of the Africa map, we know that China needs, quote, Africa's largest market for, for her overseas construction contracts, end of quote. Here, what is clear is that China, right, is poor in certain natural resources and does need uh, minerals and metals from Africa since it does not have enough of its own to meet its expanding industrial needs. From this perspective, Aquarius work suggests a critical mindedness which calls attention to how in a highly interdependent world, no continent or country uh, has monopoly over begging. In a sense, his works visualize for us Francis Nyamdo's call for embracing a social reality and engagement embedded in recognition of incompleteness. This acknowledgement makes us aware of how our imperfection, no, this acknowledgement makes us aware of our imperfections and to realize our dependence on interconnections, relatedness, open-mindedness, and multiplicities of being in the world, end of quote. So I'm going to move on to the next um, segment of my presentation, which deals with uh, what I term as the pleasures of um, popular visuality. So in this section, I investigate the particularities of aqueous satirical works within the notion of pleasures um, of popular visuality. I investigate this focus through the question, in our contemporary and overly socially saturated landscape, what makes the work of a visual satiric, uh, satirist pleasurable? And I explore this question with, within a unique understanding of the word pleasure in Akan, a Ghanaian language. This view of pleasure, um, sorry, this view of pleasure glossed in Akana's Enigye takes quote, seen as a means of looking for something, especially as it relates to images in order to discern from them certain perspectives and to be eventually enlightened by the insights therein. In pursuing an aspect of pleasure in Akwe's work, I highlight and discuss some key features of the strategic choices that he utilizes to augment his uh, thematic, um, how's it called, interest. My approach to pleasure responds to recent admissions in the humanities about the need to transcend conceptual limitations inherent in the normative understanding of the English phrase pleasure. A consequence of this limitation, as one high profile 2019 uh, pleasure conference uh, call for paper, papers puts it, is that the world has foreclosed any engagement with innovative ways of understanding pleasure in our present moment, end of quote. Through this approach to pleasure situated within a locally inflected Ghanaian perspective, my goal is to signal two issues. The first is to argue that a key way out of our current conceptual dead end embedded in the normative understanding of pleasure is to begin engaging with competing meaning calibrations in other languages beyond English. Such an approach affords us a more expansive view of the term which moves us beyond the incomplete vision inherent in the English equivalent. Okay. So the Akan word, Enigye, a body part expression which, uh, with a metaphorical meaning, is a compound noun consisting of two words, Enig, which is I, and J, which is get or to clay. So literally, Enigye translates as eyes have gained or eyes have claimed, or what the eye gets. The word shares with the English signification of pleasure such meanings as, quote, the condition or sensation induced by the experience or anticipation of what is felt to be good or desirable, a feeling of happy satisfaction or enjoyment, delight or you know, sexual gratification. 
However, a Nietzsche departs from the above understanding of the English equivalent in one key respect. Pleasure in English suggests an already processed feeling, whilst the Akan equivalent acknowledges an extra explicit ocular sensing of a phenomenon, which then has to be internalized to give it a contextualized constituent of having received something. In other words, in Akan, Enigia implies this question, Enigia being translated as pleasure from what? Or what sort of pleasure? To answer this question appropriately is to delve into the contextual vagaries of delight or joy made possible through the Akan word Enigia. In other words, there are varying types of Enigia, for example, and I'll just translate into English straight. One can have music or musical pleasure, and new energy, alcohol consumption pleasure, uh, and sanum energy, or pleasure derived from engaging one aspect of one's body in a sexual activity, a DMO energy, and pleasure de derived from looking, in shemo energy. Here, what is clear is that in a hand, unlike pleasure in English, There seems to, um, the English equivalent seems to have an already processed ring to it. And Nietzsche has a processual dimension, a processual dimension that depends on the part of the body which first senses or experiences the phenomenon and which is then processed to have an assured meaning of what is experienced as pleasure. So with regards to visual media, the Nietzsche one derives results from engaging one sensory perception with such images, subjecting it or processing these images through code, conventions that enable certain possibilities of meaning and through which one learns something leading towards one social and political enlightenment. And here I'm quoting Atukwesen. So the specific type of energy that is relevant to my analysis of Aquarius work is linked to the last kind just discussed and which to read state is in two interrelated parts. The one that first begins with a visual engagement with the images, and second, the interrelated reflection on that image in the mind or imagination to discern its embedded messages, which eventually expands one's mind or expands one's horizon. That is, you know, um, yeah, that's what I've just <clears throat> talked about. Here, energy as a lens allows us to quote, see how sensing and making sense interact in the consumption of Aquarius work. And it is this expansive understanding that I adopt in this presentation and which I understand or explain as quote, sensuous perception, feeling and cognition that emerge within specific aesthetic political regimes or what Bayer calls uh, aesthetic formations. Okay. From the above, our conceptualization of Pleasure recognizes the body and mind as an undivided whole and derives from the Akan, um, Akan metaphors of vision that are extensions from the physical and concrete eye to the abstract mental and intellectual notions. Here, our distinct or my distinct approach uh, to pleasure explicitly values the entanglement of the body and the mind or the imagination in experiencing and making sense of the world. And here I'm quoting Mayer. Learning. Furthermore, the approach clearly departs from prevalent negative readings associated with the English equivalent that goes uh, or that explains the synonymous with something trivial and insignificant. Beyond the above, this beyond the above, this situated understanding of pleasure uh, to my analysis of Aquarius work not only serves to demonstrate how this lens allows us to witness how people are caught shaped by tuning their senses, inducing experiences, and making sense and gaining knowledge, and which materializes in things. And here I'm quoting Begumaya 2009. But more importantly, this particular approach joins a growing scholarly consensus in the humanities and social sciences that take code, that take the body as a source of existence that generates and shapes one's experience. In exploring Aquarius work from this perspective, <clears throat> I investigate and discuss certain features of the artist's style, which he utilizes to complement his visual critiques. 
and which enables those critiques um, to be experienced as pleasurable in that consent. But in doing so, I circle back to the first level of energy, which spotlights um, the processual character of what the eye gains or what the eye gets or what the eye claims. This feature of Anidia is intimately linked with the very character of Aquarius work. Here, I argue that to experience Aquarius work as pleasurable within the framework of outlined requires engaging one's eyes with the pieces. <clears throat> the eyes are not merely the mental, are not merely the central apparatus for seeing his work. They are firmly entailed in certain cultural modes of interpretation that converting sin into a processual transaction that accords better with the term energy in the fullest sense of the term. Such an engagement enables the viewer, for example, to tease out certain specific barren resources that the artist imbues in his work. Following this process is one's reflection of the work through, quote, an apparatus of assumptions and inclinations and habits and routines, historical associations and cultural practices that gets the work its meaning and thus help render such works pleasurable. The method of teasing out the various properties um, that Aquae uses in its work requires, quote, a process of abstraction entailed in abstracting certain strategic stylistic choices that the artist <clears throat> adopts in the composition of his pieces. Like David Morgan in 2012, I take abstraction to mean an epistemological procedure of separating essences from accident, differentiating general and from the particular. In operationalizing the abstraction process at, as it relates to um, Aquarius work, takes place in two interrelated steps. The first involves examining the entirety of his unpublished and unpublished works. The goal of this exercise um, helps to identify underlying features that are core to the art artist's pieces. Following this procedure, I then selected those exemplars that I examined in this paper and further scrutinized them to ensure that they reflected the abstracted qualities I had identified. The features I discussed as cumulatively aiding to induce pleasure within the Niger framework uh, are not to suggest that anyone who encounters but an Aquarius work <clears throat> will be in lockstep with seeing those features and derive pleasure. Rather, it will be those with the eyes of, quote, a social body of community of audiences um, animated by a certain common ethos and being sociopolitically aware of the background of Aquarius work, uh, of Aquarius themes, and being sympathetic or unsympathetic to these um, ideas. Um, it is those, it, it is such people who see uh, his work from the perspective I've outlined. Some of this require a process of slow induction into the internalized scene of his paintings. So in an Aquarius work, one notices some key qualities that augment his pieces uh, and which all come together to, for one to be able to experience his work as pleasurable. One is his choice to spotlight iconic, <clears throat> um, sorry, iconic world leaders, senior government officials, and entertainment celebrities. This trait is perhaps as a result of his interest in publicly contributing to present national and global topical issues. Beyond the above, Aquarius artistic style utilizes not only vivid colors to render his figures in almost realistic photographic form, but it also presents them with purposeful deformations. These creative distortions, which could bend the rules of conventional appearances to eventually portray an alternative world, <clears throat> end of quote, manifest in his character's large heads, diminutive bodies, as well as exaggerated ears, noses, teeth, and mouths. Another dimension of Aquarius style is his strate strategic representation of characters <clears throat> in ironic uh, juxtapositions as we witness in you know, war is love. Here, Aquaire deploys these exceptional artistic choices to simultaneously focus our ways of seeing his symbolic thematic critiques, as well as to let us critically see with purpose the original meaning of his satirical portrayals, as we see in the other um, examples I've shown. 
In these images, we, um, we observe characters in the likeness of former President Barack Obama and Muammar Gaddafi. In addition, we encounter global uh, movie cele celebrities such as Bolo Young, as I showed you earlier. <clears throat> Beyond the rendition of these characters in a recognizable, colorful manner, particularly, um, sorry, beyond the rendition of these characters in a recognizable, uh, colorful manner, acquire pushes particularly powerful uh, thematic agendas through his unique representation of these figures to enhance um, the work's pleasurableness. For example, in Sans Tears, which we see here, <clears throat> Um, a diminutive, teary-eyed, forlorn, Obama-like image with blood-stained hands kneels before a contrastingly giant-sized figure in the semblance of Muhammad Gaddafi. Obama character, Obama's character directs his hidden gaze um, at a seated and equally teary-eyed Gaddafi who decidedly avoids his eye contact. <clears throat> The contrast in the respective gazes, body sizes, and posi position of these characters in the sun's tears serve as an apt lounge pad for Aquare to initiate a sting stinging um, satirical critique of the unequal power relations that existed between Obama and Gaddafi. The basis of Aquare's view in this work is an actual fraught affiliation between the two world leaders. A Lesher's version of this relationship was how Obama, during his presidency in 2011, snubbed Gaddafi, Gaddafi's pleas through an open letter to intervene and halt NATO's airstrikes against Libya. We also witnessed a different facet of this relationship in Obama's authorization of code, supposedly limited military interventions in Libya, which mushroomed into campaigns for regime change, end of quote. This action led to Gaddafi's extrajudicial death at the hands of rebel militants and eventually contribute to the current political instability in Libya. With this background, one can argue that Akwe, through Sun's tears, advances several critiques. The first is to provide an unequivocal corrective to the opaque political double speak by then US government, represented by Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> Regarding Obama's, uh, regarding the United States' involvement in toppling Gaddafi and his eventual murder. For example, in 2011, um, Hillary Clinton infamously quipped amidst gleeful laughter uh, by stating that we came, we saw, he died. This spontaneous but cleverly worded uh, phrase erases the US uh, involvement in the regime change in Libya. Also, in an interview with Fox News in 2011, when President Obama was asked what was his worst blunder in the office, he remarked that Libya was, quote, the worst mistake of his presidency. <clears throat> Specifically, sorry, um, although George Ernst, then White House spokesperson, expounded on this worst mistake as, quote, the United States and the rest of the members of our coalition not doing their work, Aquarius peace demands a further categorical clarification. Specifically, he demands that Obama should publicly acknowledge the failure of the intervention as, quote, a shit show, a phrase that Obama actually used in an off the record remark about his assessment of United States involvement in Libya. One sees um, the suggestive evidence of the about point through the cumulative effect in sans tears where we see Obama with blood-stained um, hands. The second position that um, Aquai advances in Sun's tears, <clears throat> especially through what appears to be Gaddafi's uncomfortable averted gaze, is to, is to spotlight how he sees Obama's apology as hypocritical. The case for this phony apology is evident in our current knowledge that from the very beginning, quote, the Libyan intervention was about regime change and not about protecting peaceful, pro-democracy Libyan citizens. This reading is partially informed by an interview I conducted with Aquair regarding the inspiration for this work. Here he noted that the motivation came from reading about Obama's claim regarding his regret for not planning for Libya's nation building after the intervention. According to Aquair, 
Um, this claim sounded funny and calculated to save face, end of quote. Aquel's last critique, especially the other supplicating subdued and miniature Obama, compared to the dignified giant-like aspect of Gaddafi, projects a particular view of the United States that is often muted in global news outlets. According to the artist, <clears throat> the choice in this depiction is to append the United States back and calculated global media portrayal of other nations in the world as bastions of evil, while the United States government is projected as, as an upright and do no wrong geopolitical entity. Aquarius intimated in an interview um, <clears throat> that through the visual strategy of presenting a symbolically cowed United States, he is asserting that is asserting that the misleading projected image of the US as a morally superior country should be permanently discredited and abandoned. End of quote. In sum, through this image, Aquare noted that he hopes the work remedies and highlights what most global media houses and Hollywood conveniently ignore about the involvement um, and capacity of the United States government to act duplicitously, which, get, which got hundreds of thousands of people killed in the Iraq war. And I'm, I'm getting to a close. In the above, I have explored some of the qualities that Akwe utilizes in executing his satirical works to spotlight his subject matters, which he eventually afford pleasure to his audiences in terms of expanding <clears throat> their insights on certain topics through the artist's visual contestation of uh, social events and dominant political account. As earlier discussed, our understanding of pleasure, of the pleasure derived from, as earlier discussed, our understanding of the pleasure that we see here derives from the kind word energy. That first requires an ocular uh, acquaintance with an image, which is then processed to allow a comprehension of what an, of what an image or the images stand for. Such familiarity in our case includes being able to abstract his stylistic choices, such as his use of vivid colors, ironic contrast, and satirical deformations, and using that information in addition to contextual evidence to get to the artist's thematic um, critiques. As, argue, as argued, it is the cumulative process um, of, it is a cumulative process, process uh, that enables one to derive energy from his works. <clears throat> In all, um, what I have attempted to do in this presentation is to encourage um, our critical engagement with popular media genres, as they are also key resources that also equally partake in the serious issues associated with our social and political lives. As well, through my engagement with a locally inflated Ghanaian understanding of pleasure to explore acquire satirical works as pleasurable, my goal is to encourage our integration of style step popular epistemologies informed by popular universes and ideas of reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, a very interesting presentation. Now, do we have any questions from the audience? From the online audience, maybe? Okay, so maybe I can start. Um, so. I would like to refer to kind of a broader uh, perspective. So uh, mm -hmm. you've talked about the cartoons, the satires related to uh, Ghana-China relations or uh, Ghana-U-U-U-U-S relations. But what about other topics? What are the other topics covered by, by the cartoonist, Ghanaian cartoonists, uh, um, we, uh, who try to provide a counter discourse kind of perspective to what the public mainstream media presents? I mean, um, different kind of uh, issues. What, what are the other topics covered by them? Okay, so Bright also deals with um, um, issues. So not only does he engage um, with global issues, he also uh, engage with specific uh, Ghanaian topics um, or uh, Ghanaian topics such as corruption. Um, government um, inefficiency, uh, nepotism, etc. So he deals with these issues as, as well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and any examples of uh, other, um, I mean, of, of these issues, particular examples? Okay, so um, about a year ago, um, the government of Ghana decided to build a cathedral. Mm -hmm. And this cathedral uh, cost millions of dollars. Um, and they were, you know, uh, of course, from the government side, they were, how's it called? Um, they were defending, you know, um, why it is necessary that they should build uh, this uh, cathedral. Bright Aquab drew a lot of, um, came out with a lot of uh, visual satirical works that showed or that provided the other alternative perspective that in fact, you know, the government's insistence to build this cathedral was because of, you know, kickbacks that he was going to get, right? So, um, so this is one, you know, one tiny example where mm -hmm. his works, you know, engage with, you know, um, or his works provide a counter discourse, right? To, um, how to call it, to mainstream or to official uh, pro pro proclamations to uh, topics um, that the government's come up with. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now maybe a question about um, more related to this to this title of your presentation, the the, the words about con uh, convivial scholar scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is your opinion? How uh, should we? How can we incorporate new other ways of thinking of um, mm -hmm. which are not kind of presented? Present, I mean, uh, in in the in the knowledge production, um, to some extent, how to unlearn all those those things that that we already know, uh, kind of standard ways of thinking, knowing, analyzing, discussing different issues, uh, from race to colonialism to I don't know to sexuality to gen uh, and gender, health issues and ethnicity. Um, mm. Is it possible somehow to write new syllabus, uh, design different university courses, so that they are not so much I don't know uh, stick stuck with with all the standard knowledge? Mm -hmm. So here you mentioned the examples of cartoons as a different way a source mm -hmm. of uh, knowledge. So what about mm -hmm. this broader pr perspective, maybe? Mm -hmm. I, I think. Um one thing um, embedded in, or as I understand it, um, and it's embedded in convivial scholarship, mm -hmm. is two things. One is the, the humility to acknowledge that within my, my discipline is not, the, uh, my discipline does not contain all the knowledge there is. And once you acknowledge that, then it, it allows you uh, to you know, um, go into other disciplines to see what type of knowledge system that exists. So yes, um, humility to say that, you know, my discipline is not enough. I need to explore in other disciplinary domains um, is one. And related to the issue of humility is the notion of incompleteness, that my discipline uh, cannot be complete on its own, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, you know, let me see what exists in other domains as well. And what that obviously means is going beyond, you know, and what I talked about in my presentation, uh, even going beyond the academy to see popular understanding of being in this world, for example, right? So in, in, I, I can give you a very specific, um, let's call it antidote, but we can move on from the general premise that we should uh, acknowledge the incompleteness of the knowledge systems, of the practices within our disciplines, and have the humility to move into other domains to see what exists so that we can learn, you know, and implement ideas from those, um, how to call, from those, um, from those disciplines. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm, now, um... Um, referring to the so-called indigenous knowledge systems um, mm -hmm. in, in of Africa, um, mm -hmm. that um, 
I mean, uh, recent uh, research uh, proved that the, the, these indigenous knowledge systems uh, contain a lot of uh, alternative ideas um, mm -hmm. and effective practices which could be uh, utilized um, in a better way. I mean, and could help local societies to solve their political, uh, socio-economic problems, uh, problems of development. So, um, and of course, given uh, given the the, um, the resilience, the kind of a strong presence of uh, of this colonial education in African countries. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that um, is it possible that this indigenous traditional knowledge uh, will be somehow more visible in the future? Are there any attempts um, to, to change this, uh, this situation uh, undertaken by, by local people, um, by the universities, maybe by some politicians? Or, mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I think um, policymakers as well as university administrators need to accept the fact that, you know, um, the educational system that we have inherited is a colonial, you know, um, it's, um, it's a colonial, you know, um, how to call it, heritage, if you can mm -hmm. call it that. And this acknowledgement of, you know, um, give them that humility to begin to explore indigenous ideas um, and therefore encourage you know the teaching of such ideas um, or incorporate such ideas into the curriculum and i'll give you a specific example um, african philosophy should begin to be taught right mm -hmm. in all universities right and Doing so, you know, it begin to um, create this sense of how should I put it? It creates um, it, it begins to create a sense of pride, which of course make people to delve deeper into um, ideas that exist in, in um, local cultures. Another example is a, a very common example is um, which you know um, most people kind of look down upon um, regards to you know, proverbs, right? Proverbs mm -hmm. are, you know, um, storehouses of, you know, um, of various, you know, um, knowledge systems that can be explored, right? right? But, you know, for some reason, there is this negative uh, attitude towards proverbs as, you know, uh, kind of hackney and will not be able to teach you anything because all that you need is to master proverbs and you are fine. But mastering proverbs, um, it's not the all of it. You need to be creative or you need to be sensitive to know the specific context to be able to use it in ways that will be appreciated, you know, um, by the people that understand it. So all that I'm trying to say is that um, it's possible if university administrators um, and, you know, uh, educational policy makers would embrace the idea that, you know, um, Local knowledge, uh, local knowledge systems are important sources um, by which we can educate our students. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and uh, now maybe a following question, um, or maybe do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, from the online audience? Uh, you want to ask a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, hello. I was Hi. thinking uh, about uh, those pictures uh, yes. because uh, pictures you uh, show us, they are um, colorful, detailed, and I think for printing they need really good paper, <laughs> uh, maybe some glossy paper. And um, yesterday we saw another example of um, visual comments of, uh, of uh, politics and everything uh, from Umundo Police. And they built um, this uh, pictogram system because they want to print this very cheap uh, for the posters. But uh, um, on Mundo Feliz Way, uh, allowed to print very cheap and put a lot of this on the streets, but uh, also uh, this is um, necessary uh, to build kind of language, like letters. You can uh, then 
uh, your um, pictures, pi pictures you show us, uh, they are, um, I think, more easy for common people. But I'm not sure uh, if this is possible that they are really popular. Then maybe uh, you can uh, tell us uh, in which way uh, those pictures go to people. Um, in, and which kind of people can uh, sell these pictures? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this particular artist is very uh, social media savvy, um, and the base of the base uh, of his fans um, are people from high school and people in universities. People that, let's put it this way, um, his base includes you know high school and people in the universities um and because he puts his work uh, on social media so facebook um, instagram um how's it called uh, twitter um it by looking at the comments right you can and by looking at people that like and comment you can say he has a, a broad base of um audiences, part of which are, um, how to call, um, educated folks. And if you even look at even the grammar of those that comment, you realize that you know, there are not so many educated people as well. So judging from, um, from that, uh, we can say that, you know, he has a very broad base audiences that he reaches. I've also attended several of his, um, how to call, exhibitions. And he does two types of exhibitions. One is in formal galleries, and then he has, um, how's it called? He does like um, street, just, um, he prints these artworks and does uh, street installations, right? And anytime that he does that, the audiences cut across um, in terms of, you know, um, class and in terms of education, right? So by virtue of these observations, um, I would argue that his works um, reaches, you know, a, a wider audience, which cuts across with you know, people that are highly educated and people that are not so highly educated. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, you. Another questions from the online audience. No, okay. So maybe one more from me. Um, uh, apart from the cartoonists. Um, hmm. I, I know uh, that there is a group of uh, journalists, at least I know one name, uh, that probably uh, it was you that mentioned me uh, for the first time. Uh, so uh, it is Anas, uh, Aremajo Anas, uh, so mm -hmm. an investigative uh, journalist. So uh, could you could you somehow present his um, person to us and tell us what kind of uh, somehow invisible issues um, th this person uh, um, discusses uh, in his uh, in his articles um, and um, somehow gives the counter uh, this discourse um, analysis of, of the of the problems okay so Anas Amayal um, is an investi investigative journalist um, in Ghana who has um, uncovered or highlighted very you know high profile uh, corruption cases in the country mm -hmm. um so far no, nobody knows um how he looks like of course because of obvious reasons uh, he uncovers high profile corruption cases so uh, just like anywhere in the world you know people are after his head if you can put it that way um so an example of one profile, uh, an example of one high profile case that he, um, he documented um, was demonstrating that certain judges in Ghana uh, were corrupt. And um, he had visual evidence where these judges were collecting money, you know, um, sometimes through intermediaries, sometimes even in their homes, sometimes even in their offices, right? Um, it was <laughs> some even going as low, even you know, as accepting goats and yams. Um, I don't know if uh, Poland has yams, but maybe potatoes equivalent. Um, 
and you know he, he did that um, to um, how to call to show the fact that you know um, justice in Ghana was not being uh, fair. So so that, that's one example. The other example was to do a high you know um, a high profile case where uh, he was able to uh, show um, how to call um, immigration officers who collected bribe right um, all collected bribes at Ghana's, uh, in certain parts of Ghana's borders. Now, how, how does um, his work uh, provide a counter discourse to the normative you know, um, narrative? The norm normative narrative in Ghana, uh, within the judiciary and among immigration, among the Ghana Immigration Service was that they don't collect bribes, they do their jobs, you know, um, nothing happens, everything they are doing is fair. And he was saying that, no, Actually, what you guys are saying is false. And the question was, provide us proof, right? Provide us proof. And he was like, okay, people will take your time. And that's what precisely, um, that's what precisely um, something that he did, showing proof that these, there were certain judges, um, not all of them, because he also showcased certain judges who, were, who he approached and who uh, <clears throat> who, who refused to take you know bribes? So um, uh, Anas, um, an investigative journalist that nobody has seen before, um, produces these documentaries. They're actually documentaries that provide um, evidence to the fact that there are certain sectors in Ghana. Um, where corruption is right. I think he's done that in one or two um, African countries. I think the, the, the documentary that he did um, in, not in Ghana, I've forgotten the name of the, of the particular African country, or was to expose people that were harming uh, albinos because they were using albinos for you know, certain purposes. Um, and he exposed those people. I don't know if that answers your question, Monica. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you very much. And uh, mm -hmm. any questions from the audience? So maybe the last one from me, um, kind of returning, um, referring to, to the first questions that I asked. So mm -hmm. expanding more on this topic of the colonization, the colonizing. Uh, the universities to knowledge mm. production. So, um, uh, recent uh, uh, d during uh, recent years, so we had a lot of um, uh, we we uh, th there was a lot of uh, information about student protests uh, in African countries. Um, uh, students uh, protested against this co kind of uh, standard colonized uh, syllabuses. Uh, education systems mm. uh, they, they kind of uh, demanded demanded to uh, to, to uh, remove some kind of uh, stat statues of uh, former British uh, uh, colonizers imperialists like, like it was in Cape, Cape Town in South Africa mm -hmm. so why do you think why so many universities not only in Africa but also in other countries like especially in the UK um, still somehow protect this kind of racist um, colonial figures uh, and why do they deny black students or students of color access to, to education I mean we know that there are some kind of fellowship scholarships for them but still, they they have um, their their access is uh, limited uh, to 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 this knowledge. Um, why why is this situation? Why there is such a nostalgia for um, colonial? I mean, for imperialism somehow. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and maybe last so question. Why these oh. are students, not the yeah. staff, not the faculty that, that yeah. deal with the issue and try to change the situation? Mm -hmm. I, 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 so the age or what? 
Yeah, okay, so I see yeah, so I see your submission in two forms. So one is um, why is it that you have students who are at the forefront of this fight, mm -hmm. right? To to um, to kind of dismantle these uh, imperialist uh, practices um, that, that does not allow a holistic, you know, educational experience. Um, I, I I think the um, you know the the administrators and to a large extent, the faculty are. Uh, are beneficiaries, right? Are beneficiaries of the, you know, this perpetration of, um, let's call it imperialist agenda, etc. And they, 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 this, they won't benefit if they mm -hmm. leave this charge, right? So it is not in their interest to, um, you know, to call for such a radical, um, how's it called? Um, Let's call reforms, if you can mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, and it is, and the students are, you know, you know they, I don't want to say they don't have anything to lose, right? But in, in, in a sense, they are. I mean, there's something to be said about you know useful exuberance and and in identifying the limitations in society and then getting rid of those um, practices. So mm -hmm. so so that is one. In terms of um, the the reluctance of of um, certain institutions to remove these colonial structures, um, I mean, I think you hinted at it's it's um, it's it's a form of one. It's you know it's some form of bad nostalgia um, for um, these um, you know old white men, and a way it's you know. We all know the power of uh, subliminal messages, right? Mm -hmm. They are aware that these, you know, uh, statues uh, are performing the very thing that they want to, they want to perform, mm -hmm. you know, make you feel inferior, make you feel less of a human being. Uh, yes, we'll give you the road scholarship, right? Uh, but when you come, you are going to know that we are still on top, right? So I, the, I feel this um this love right this love for maintaining these structures of people that were clearly racist that had clearly um you know um enacted you know uh, certain practice some heinous practices this love to maintain the status of these folks is precisely to reinforce this subliminal message that you don't matter um, you are inferior, um, and we don't even care what you think. Um, so yeah, that would be my off, off the cuff, off the cuff remark. Yeah. Good. I, I can see that we have uh, one question from the online, uh, online okay. audience on Mundo Feliz, mm. so I will mm. read it. Um, so the didactic and dialectical basis of critical design allows us to reinvent the way we look at consider and assimilate contemporary visual culture as a whole. Uh, this kind of perspective questions uh, the status quo and should be an example of contemporary curators, artists and designers in Africa. What's your opinion? The words uh, are of uh, Azu Nwangufogu, uh, the director of African Artists Foundation based in Lagos, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, Azu, I totally agree agree with you. Um, um, as as an informal curator, I kind of detest um, the, the the white cube way of you know uh, displaying artifacts um, artifacts in um, how's it called in um, how's it called in a gallery in a gallery or in galleries, for example. I you know I totally. Um, support this new move to have mobile galleries you know where the gallery is placed uh, placed within centers where you know everyone have access you know um, the, the gallery in, in my estimation is a very elitist space right so we need to again decolonize um, the gallery space for example where we take knowledge or we take aesthetic experience to the people let all and sundry you know enjoy it. 
rather than having this white cube space, air conditioned, uh, where you have to you know dress in a certain way. I mean, nobody nobody will kick you out, but you are looked on in in not a nice way, right? So um, Azu, I am totally with you, you know, um, about this move, you know, that help us to reinvent the way that we display museum, uh, museums, the way that we display artifacts or uh, art artworks in, how to call it, in galleries, etc. So we are total, I'm totally in sync with um, your, your uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So um, maybe, do we have any other questions? Um, maybe if not, maybe we can uh, stop at this moment. So yeah, thank you very um, much for your yeah, great you. contribution and uh, hope you can enjoy the rest of the conference. So as for the other participants, we have a um, longer break, coffee break today. So we start uh, session number seven at, uh, at noon at 12. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And bye thanks bye. for the opportunity too. Yeah.